Welcome to Kingdom Come Ministries live stream. We pray that you had a great Christmas with your loved ones. Here at KCM, our leaders are Apostle William Rogers Jr. and Pastor and Prophetess Dr. Donna Rogers. We are so very grateful that you have decided to join us today. Our prayer is that you receive all that God has created you to be. We ask that you contact a friend or a loved one and let them know that there is a word for them on today. Now, let's prepare our minds to be blessed by the word of God. of scripture is the gospel according to St. Matthews. We're looking at chapter 1 and we're looking at verse 23. The new covenant, the King James Version. It says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. And that is the word of the Lord. I want to speak on five points today concerning the birth of Jesus. And again, I'm telling you, the way the children church ministry told us about who Jesus was, I said to myself, shut your books. You don't even have to have service today. But I understand that I want to press into that a little bit more. Because in a post-Christian culture, it may be more vital than ever to show that the facts the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus' life matters. Now, the Christmas story is not a fiction. It's, it's, it's not something that someone made up or thought up. Or every time this year, we want to just tell this same story. No, most people define Christmas, as I said, with the Christmas trees and the giving of gifts and the bowls and, and decorating your front yard and putting the nativity scene in your home in the front yard. Spending all your money and going in debt. And that's not the meaning of Christmas. That's not what Christmas is all about. Christmas isn't about holiday feelings. It's about God. Oh, I want to make it real clear. It's about God who promised men and women long ago that he would send his Messiah, the promised deliverer, for them to save them and give them hope. This is why we celebrate Christmas. This is why Jesus came, so we can have hope. Those of you that's hopeless, I want to encourage you today. You don't have to stay in that condition because Christ has came for you to have hope. It's about God delivering on his promises century later at the place and moment of his choosing through the birth of his son Jesus. So now we're understanding and keeping our mind eye of understanding wide open that we celebrate Christmas because we are celebrating with joy the miraculous birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who took on flesh and blood to die for our sins. So point number one, Jesus' birth is according to God's plan. Jesus' birth at Bethlehem, where he was wrapped in flesh and cradled in a manger was not an accident an unfortunate incident that happens unexpectedly and unintentionally. No, it was an appointment, an arrangement at a particular time and place. It was ordained by God before the foundation of the world. Jesus came in the fullness of time. And it is worth noting that he will come again when the time is set. Please go with me to Galatians. We're looking at chapter 4. And we're looking at verses 4 through verse 5. The new covenant, the amplified version. It says, but when in God's plan, the proper fullness of time 
had fully come. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the regulation of the law, under the requirements of the old covenant law, so that he might redeem and liberate, set free by paying a price those who were under the requirements of the old covenant law, that we who believe might be legally adopted as sons, as God's children with all rights, as fully grown members of a family. So the Lord Jesus came. God came, Emmanuel. God with us. God in us. And God for us. Stepped down through 40 and two generations. Put on a body of flesh just to rescue us. So we don't have to live in poverty. We don't have to live defeated. We don't have to live confused. We don't have to feel rejected. We don't have to live in despair or despondency. Why? Because Christ came for us. And so now we have to understand as sons of God, as an heir of God, we have the same position, the same privilege, and the same power with God that Jesus Christ has. And when we don't understand this, we live beneath our privilege. We live like we are not heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We live in defeat. We live in bondage because we don't understand our rights. The fullness of time speaks of that which has come to completion. It declares that Christ's birth was fixed in the counsel of God. And that predetermined hour had now arrived. Please go with me to 1 Peter and we're looking at chapter 1. We're looking at verse 20, the new covenant, the amplified version. And it says, for he, Jesus, he was foreordained. In other words, he was foreknown before the foundation, before the creation of the world. But has appeared publicly, has been manifested in these last times for your sake. Jesus Christ is the eternal purpose of God. I don't know what we think life is about. I don't know what we think we're living for. I don't know if we understand why we celebrate Christmas. But I want to speak with a clarity in your spirit so you won't have an excuse that you didn't know. Jesus Christ is the eternal purpose of God. It was before the creation of the world that he was predestined for the work which was given him to do. God had everything set up. God had everything planned out. God had everything prearranged, predetermined. Everything was set. He was just waiting on the proper time. Salvation was planned of God from the beginning. But it was not fulfilled until Jesus came and went to the cross. This is the reason why we don't have an excuse to stay in situations that we're in that's not productive. This is the reason why we don't have an excuse not to succeed and not to be successful and not to be prosperous and not to move forward in our destiny. Why? Because Emmanuel, God is with us. He's in us and he's for us. We, we got to understand this now. We can't just live all the days of our life out of a church or out of a church mentality and don't understand the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is in us. The power of God resides in us. No matter what situation you're in, what circumstances you're in, you can be at the bank, you can be at the store, you can be on your job, you can be in the community. You better know that Emmanuel is with you. And then sometimes you got to prophesy it to yourself. You can be by yourself and tell yourself, I don't know what, who they think they bother them with because God is with me, God is in me, and God is for me. Who am I talking to today? Because I'm going to talk to you. So we find the biblical idea of predestination in the old covenant in the vocation of Abraham, the election of Isaac and the rejection of Ishmael, for example. We also find the same idea in the new covenant after Jesus, after God established a new covenant with mankind. Please go with me to the book of Ephesians. We're looking at chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 3 through verse 5, the new covenant, 
the amplified version. And the story and the scriptures and history is allowing us to know how God, before the foundation of the world, he already chose us and, and preordained us and picked us out and, and had our uh, destiny in mind. It says here in verse 3, blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing benefits that relate to our spiritual life in the heavenly realms in Christ. Just as in his love, he chose us in Christ, not in ourselves, in Christ. He actually selected us for himself as his own. When, when, when did Christ choose me? When did Christ say I was his? When did Christ allow me? to have the benefits, to have the same position, to have the same power. When did this happen? Before the foundation. Before I was even thought of. Before the sperm hit the egg. Before my name was even known. Before I came forth from my mother's womb. He had already chose me, and that's why the sperm hit the egg and I had to come forth from my mother's womb because I was chosen by God Amen. before the foundation, before he created the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea. He thought of me. Oh, my God. Before, before he even created creation and said, let there be light, before he even thought of creation, and say, let the waters bring forth. He thought of me. He actually selected us for him as his own before. That's predestination. The foundation before the creation. So can't nobody go back to before when God created me and said I was his own and tell me I ain't his. Because it says before the foundation, before the creation of the world. Yeah, he chose us for purpose so that we would be holy, that is consecrated, set apart for him, purpose-driven, and blameless in his sight. So this indicates that he chose us according to foreknowledge. Pastor, what are you saying? He knew I was going to mess up. But he still chose me. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you today because you need to be talked to. He knew there was going to be some bloops and blunders in your life. Somebody said, but he still chose me. <laughs> he knew you wasn't going to get everything right. Somebody say, but he still chose me. You got to understand this because if you don't understand this, then the enemy will try to talk you out of your inheritance and talk you out of your position and your power and your authority in the Lord Jesus. You got to remind the devil, no, 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 uh, this mistake, this mess up, this bloop and this blunder don't define who I am. It's just a part of my experience, just a part of my history. But that's not who God says I am. He chose me before the foundation. Oh, I'm going to talk to you today. You got to understand this. Foreknowledge refers to the all-knowing, I'm not science, nature of God. Whereby he knows reality before it is real. <laughs> all things and events before they even happen. And all people before they exist. Somebody say, he still chose me. Mm -hmm. Nothing in the future is hidden from God's eye. You have to understand this. God sees our lives, our bodies, and our days even before we are conceived. Matter of fact, scripture says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. It says, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to pass. And so we understand, verse 5 of Ephesians 1 says, in love, he predestined, ordained beforehand, and lovingly planned, predetermined for us to be adopted to himself as his own. Children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the kind of intention and good pleasures of his will. 
So it's showing here that as God foreordained Christ, as God chose Christ before the foundation of the world, he also chose us. Just as Jesus had a set time for his time on earth, you and I have a set time as well. And you need to understand this. Don't, don't just live haphazardly thinking, you know, you got time. No, you, you have to understand it's God that blew that breath into your body. You breathe in his breath. And when he take it away, you're not going to have breath in your body. You have to understand God have allotted our times and allotted our days. Go with me to Acts. We're looking at chapter 17. And we're looking at verse 26, the new covenant, the amplified version, as we lay today's lesson and give these five points. It says, and he, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands and territories. So now we understand God sets the limits for our lives. It's, it's God that does that. Our lives are totally bounded by God. He has set the boundaries of our existence. God set. He, he know how many hairs we have in our head. He, he know when we would birth. He know when we shall leave this earth. God sets the bounds, the boundaries, the time, the alignments of our life. He know who we were supposed to be born to. He know what city we're supposed to live in. He know who we're supposed to be married to. He know how many children we're supposed to have. He know what we're supposed to work. He knows. The assignment that's on our lives. Point number two, Jesus' birth is according to God's power. Most often, a genealogy identifies a child as the seed of the father. But scripture tells us today Jesus was born of a woman. To single out just the woman is to give a clear reference to the virgin conception and birth of our Lord and Savior. All through scripture, the promise was given that the Messiah would be miraculously born just of the woman. Please go with me to Genesis. We're looking at chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 15. The Old Covenant, the Amplified Version. It says, and I, God, will put enmity, open hostility, between you and the woman, and between your seed, uh, your seed, your offspring and her seed, not the man's seed, her seed, he shall fatally bruise her head and you shall only bruise his heel. This is the first prophecy about the Messiah who through his death on the cross and resurrection would ultimately defeat Satan. This is the first prophecy when Adam and Eve was in the garden and they disobeyed God. This was the first prophecy that God gave concerning the Lord Jesus. Please go with me to Isaiah. We're looking at chapter 7, verse 14, the Old Covenant, the Amplified Bible. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Listen carefully. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. God with us. If you don't ever remember anything else going to the end of this year, we want to finish strong. Please remember that God is with us, he's in us, and he's for us. You have to understand that. Because a lot of times in the holiday season, people get caught up in all different types of conversations and, and you have you know people at your house and there'll be family affairs and people sitting around the table, they talking, they gossiping, they talking about stuff they shouldn't talk about and, and all of that. And you have to remember, don't lose Jesus in this holiday season. You, you have to understand he's with us. Matthew's genealogy records Jesus' birth in the feminine singular as of Mary alone. The gospel according to St. Matthew's chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 16, the new covenant, the King James Version. It says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So now we understand that Jesus was born 
to rescue us. We, we understand this. Point number three, Jesus' birth is divine and not human. Because a lot of people, they try to do away with the incarnation of the birth of Christ, and, and they don't want to believe that. And you have all kind of historians and philosophers, and they want to challenge, you know, was he born on the 25th, or, or how do you know this is Jesus? How do you know this is real? We understand, and we understand it because of the word of the Lord. Jesus' birth is divine, not human. You can't understand it in your human understanding. You have to understand it by spiritual understanding. The gospel according to St. Luke, we're looking at chapter one, we're looking at verses 30 through verse 35, the new covenant, the King James Version. It says, and the angel Gabriel said unto her, fear not Mary, and reassures her, for thou hast found favor, grace with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. The Lord is salvation. He shall be great, and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And so here Gabriel is prophesying the word of the Lord to Mary. And the angel Gabriel is telling her about the eternal reign of Jesus. See, a lot of times when the word of the Lord is being spoke to us, uh, we, we see it and sometimes we hear it and it be real cloudy and we don't understand it. And, and when you deal with prophecy, it, it takes time for that prophecy to unfold like a rose petal. It, you get a prophecy and you think everything's supposed to happen right then, right there, right at once. And, and then you get discouraged and you get frustrated because somebody done gave you or supposedly gave you the word of the Lord and it don't happen. You got to understand uh, the Bible allows us to know Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When prophecy comes, it's like a rose petal and that, that petal opens little by little, by little. It don't happen all at once. And so here, the angel Gabriel is prophesying this to Mary. And he's prophesying and telling her about the eternal reign of Jesus. And the baby hadn't even been born yet. A lot of times when the Lord speak to us and the word of the Lord speak to us, the word is telling us about who we shall be, not who we are. And a lot of times we get frustrated and confused with that because we hear God saying, you shall be this. And we looking at, I don't see that. Because it's like a rose petal. It haven't unfolded yet. And we hear God calling us great. And we looking like, where, where's the greatness at? We look and hear the word of God. He tells us we're rich, we're successful, we're heirs of God. And we're looking at our bank account, looking at our money, because you don't understand prophecy. You have to understand it takes time for prophecy to unfold. And that's when people run before time and before the Lord and they get out of alignment with the Lord because they don't understand prophecy. Here the angel is telling Mary who Jesus shall be. It says in verse 34, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be? In other words, how is this process going to happen? That's, that's how we do. We hear the word of the Lord. How is this going to happen? I, I, I'm not, I don't have. And the angel of the Lord speaks to her. She said, how is this going to happen? Seeing I know not a man because we all know how conception take place says, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And we have to understand. See, when you look at this scenario and you think about this scenario, 
all of the Jewish girls, at this time Mary was about 16 years old, and all of the Jewish girls were looking to give birth to the Messiah. That's the reason why if you read in history, you read about the Bible, a lot of the little boy's name was called Joshua, Yahshua, because they thought he, he was going to be the deliverer. He was going to be the mighty one. And a lot of them waited. They waited to see if they was the one going to give birth to Emmanuel. And that's the reason why it was a curse in history in the Bible days when the women were barren and they couldn't give birth to a child because they felt like they was cursed because they wasn't going to be the one able to give birth to Emmanuel, Yahshua, uh, God, the Lord Jesus, wrapped in flesh. And this is the reason why they felt they were cursed. So Mary understood when the angel of the Lord spoke to her. She understood. You know what? I know I'm going to have some trouble now. I know it's going to be a problem. I know I'm going to be talked about. I know people are going to talk about Joseph. I know I'm going to be lied on because I'm a 16-year-old girl. I am not married, and according to Jewish customs, I shouldn't be pregnant. She knew I'm getting ready to deal with situations. And that's what a lot of people do. When God call you and he speak to you and his hand is on your life, a lot of times you push it back. Why? Because you know you're going to have to deal with trouble and situations and circumstances that you don't want to deal with. So you just say, forget it, never mind. Mary could have told Gabriel, uh-uh, tell God I'm going to pass this opportunity by. I don't want to deal with that. But a lot of times when God's hand is on you and the hand of God is on you and the anointing of God is on you, you're going to have to deal with hardship. Who am I talking to today? You're going to have to deal with it. And when you deal with it, you can't fall out and tell God, never mind. She knew that. And in spite of everything she knew she was going to have to deal with, she told Gabriel, so let it be. Point number four. Jesus' birth is according to God's purpose. Redemption becomes the far-reaching result of Jesus' miraculous birth. This was the purpose of God from the beginning. This is the reason why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come just for us to have Christmas parties. Jesus didn't come just for us to decorate Christmas trees and put light bulbs on it and drink hot chocolate with marshmallows and, and watch Christmas stories. It, that's, he, he didn't come just for that. No. He came for redemption. The scripture teaches that all men are sinners. The penalty for our sinfulness is death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus died in our place when he was crucified on the cross. We are the ones deserved to have been on that cross. But he took our place. That's, that's why he came. We were the ones that lived living, lived a sinful life. Somebody say, but he took my place. Jesus substituted himself for us and took what we rightly deserved. Get your focus back when it comes to Christmas and be thankful for everything the Lord have done. Please go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. The new covenant, the amplified version. It says, he, God, made Christ who knew no sin to be judicially be sin on our behalf so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. That is, we would be made acceptable to him and placed in a right relationship with him by his gracious love and kindness. We were ratchet filthy, nasty, had the can't help it. We were liars, robbers, thieves. You can go ahead and name some other stuff and put it in there. And we couldn't help it. The law could not help us. The law showed us our wrong, but the law couldn't help us with our wrong. So somebody had to come to help us. The Bible allows us to know when nothing else could help. Love came. <laughs> And rescued us. This is the meaning. This is the purpose for Christmas. You have to understand this. And really not just for Christmas, but for every day of our lives. 
Jesus became God's perfect, flawless substitute, lamb of sacrifice for man's sin. You have to understand it's like we were slaves. We were naked slaves. All of our stuff was showing. And we was just going around. Nothing could help us. Nothing could help us like we was on the auction block. And there was who want to buy this slave and who want to buy this slave. Well, who want to buy it? Well, have them turn around. Well, they don't got this and they, they don't have this and they don't have that. And then Jesus stepped in and said, I'll buy them. I'll take them. They don't have to have this. I'll love them. They don't have to have that. I got them. They don't have to have this. I'll give it to them. They don't have to have this. I have it. And what's mine is theirs. He bought us. He purchased us. He redeemed us. And that's why we celebrate him. Who am I talking to? We were naked. We didn't have anything. We didn't have anything. We didn't have anything going for us. You got to understand this. And then Jesus put his life on the line for us. Point number five, Jesus' birth is according to God's performance. The action of Jesus' incarnation was God sending him into the world. Jesus came as God messenger or ambassador. His coming is viewed as a commission from God to serve in this world as God representatives. Please go with me to 1 John. And we're looking at chapter 3, looking at verse 5. And we're going to read verse 8b, the New Covenant, the Amplified Version. And the word of the Lord says, You know that he appeared in visible form as a man in order to take away sins. And in him there is absolutely no sin. For he has neither the sin nature, nor has he committed sin or acts worthy of blame. So you have to understand sin is basically a matter of the will. You will to do what you want. Because when Christ came, he gave us the power to tell sin no. Mm -mm, I'm going to say that again. <clears throat> And so we were caught up in sin and bondage and they can't help us and generational curses and I acted like this because my daddy acted like that and I did this because my mama did this and I seen this and, I, and all of that. But when Jesus came, he broke all that up. And then he gave us the power to tell sin no. Somebody said, I have the power to tell sin no. And so that's the reason why sin is basically a matter of the will. Will you or will you not? For us to assert our will against God's will is rebellion. And rebellion is the root of sin. And so it goes on in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, clause B. It says, the Son of God appeared, was manifested for this purpose, to destroy, to render inoperative, to rob of power the works of the devil. He came so we don't have to live up under the bondage of sin or slavery anymore. People that's living up under the bondage of sin and slavery, you will to live like that. But you don't have to live like that. Maybe you didn't know that, so I want to clarify it and make it clear today for you in here and you out there. Uh, because Christ came, because Emmanuel came, we do not have to live up under the bondage of sin, the bondage of slavery. If we live that way, it's our will to live that way. So here we have the heart of what it means for Christmas. This is the reason for the season. This is why Christ came. So we don't have to be in bondage. And I know I'm saying it repetitiously as I read each scripture, but I want you to get that tucked away in your spirit. Twice this passage explains why Jesus appeared. This encompasses his entire life, beginning with his birth and including his life, his death, and his resurrection. We got to understand the Bible tells us, and having spoiled principalities, that's what he came to do, and powers, he made a show of them openly. Christ came and destroyed all the power that the enemy had over our life. All the power that he had 
over your finances, all the power that he had over your wealth, over your health, all the power that he had over your mental. Christ came and destroyed all of that. So either you're going to walk in what Christ came to do and walk in your inheritance and walk in your inheritance and walk in your destiny or you're going to stay up under the law. This is the whole reason for Christmas. And people get frustrated and they get bothered with everybody else. Want to blame everybody else for why they in the condition they're in. No, if you're not walking in your inheritance and living in your inheritance, if you're not staying seated in position on the right hand of God where Jesus, we're seated in heavenly places, that's because that's your choice. This is the whole reason for Christmas. Jesus came to deal with our greatest problem. Nobody else could help us. We were dying, polluted in our own blood. Nobody else could help us. We were strangling. We was choking. And nothing could help. He came to destroy the mortal enemy of our souls, Satan himself, and all of his works. I want you to hear me with a clarity today. Christmas marks the day when the invasion of the kingdom of God began. When Christ was born, that's the reason why the other kings, King Herod, they got angry. They got mad. They wanted to know, where is this king at? Because when Christ was born, it was an invasion of the kingdom of God that have come. And you have to understand that. He came. He gave us everything we needed to live this life spiritually. He gave us every benefit that we needed. He said, you're an heir of mine, you're a child of mine, this belongs to you. He gave us everything that we needed to live this life. And some still live like beggars. And some still live like they are not in the kingdom of God. And some still live like they are not children of God. It is the celebration of the arrival of an invading force that came with a mission to destroy our greatest enemy. Satan don't have no power over you. Christ destroyed that. Somebody say Satan does not have any power over me, my finances, my wealth, my health, my success, my prosperity. Now bless God for coming, taking on a body of flesh, stepping down through 42 generations just to make sure we were okay. Thank God for that understand that he ain't got nothing here don't nothing here belong to him nothing somebody shout nothing yeah, nothing he ain't got no foothold here nothing you got to decree that and you got to declare that when you don't see no money you got to speak the promise of God over your life he became poor that I may be rich rich in health rich in peace rich in wealth rich in finances you got to believe that you got to speak that stuff you got to declare that stuff Sometimes you gotta have stuff speaking all night long in your ear. You gotta have stuff playing all night long in your ear. What is doing? Reminding you of who you are. Reminding you of why Christ came. Reminding you that you are heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. Reminding you of your possessions. Reminding you of your power and your authority. Who am I talking to today? I don't know what you think you see. Uh, but you need to see with a clear vision. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. <laughs> oh my God. You got to understand this. And as we finish out this year, we want to press into the new year real strong. Walking in our identity. I got my identity back. Oh, my God. I was reminded of my purpose. I was reminded of why Christ came. I was reminded who I am in the Lord Jesus. I don't have to live like this no more. I don't have to think like this no more. I don't have to walk like this no more. Neither talk like this no more. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, I feel this. 
got to remind yourself. You got to remind yourself. Shut up. Stop all that noise. And remind yourself who God says you are. Got to remind yourself. You got to remind yourself. You got to remind yourself. You got to remind yourself. I'm telling you, sometimes you... You just got to get stuff, and it's just playing all day, walking around the house with headphones on. Why you ain't talking to us? Because you're not talking my language. I need to know who I am. I need to know who God says I am. I need to remind myself what God says. I need to fulfill this call on my life. I need to walk this thing out. He says I'm healed. I need to walk in my healing. He says I'm whole. I need to walk in my whole. He says I'm saved. I need to walk in my salvation. Who am I talking to? Yes. Yes. You got to know who you are. You got to know who you are. You have to know who you are. The enemy don't want you to know who you are. He wants you to start talking negative. We send back every word curse. We send back every lie of the devil. For the cause this curse will not come. We reverse the curse. And we send it back to the sender. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Put a praise right there. That's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. Let me let me finish getting through this point five and I'm done. That's what you have to do. You have to learn how to speak the word of God over your life and remind yourself who God says you are. I don't care if you somewhere in a back alley, in the back of a train track. I don't care if you somewhere drunk, busted, and disgusted. You better turn over and remind yourself from the foundation of the world, God called me to be a man of God. So I'm going to have to walk up out of this condition here. Please go with me to Colossians chapter 1. And we're looking at verses 13 through verse 14, the New Covenant, the TLB version. You should have a real good Christmas because you understand the meaning and the purpose and what Christ came to do. He came to remind me that I don't have to stay in this condition anymore. It's your choice. Tell your neighbor, it's your choice. Tell them you choose. Don't get mad with me because I choose not to. Don't get mad with me because I'm going to get to my destination and my assignment. Don't be bothered with me because I know who God says I am. Don't try to hinder me and stop me from walking in my purpose and my calling. You choose. You choose. You choose. Either you is or you ain't. Either you are heir or you're not. Either you a child of God or a child of the devil. You choose. You choose. Don't let nobody label you by one incident, one experience, a little history you had in your life. That ain't who I be. That ain't who I is. I am the righteousness of God. (laughs) Colossians We're looking at chapter 1 Y'all trying to make me preach And I feel like teaching We're looking at verse 13 through verse 14 The new covenant The TLB version And the word of the Lord says For he, Jesus Has Rescue delivered us out of the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom. 
from the authority of Satan and the powers of darkness. All of those powers that have you depressed and mentally disturbed and feel rejected and feel like you're not wanted and feel like there's no reason to live. All of those powers, Christ came to deliver you out of that darkness. Cloudy in your mind, in your spirit, don't feel like speaking to nobody. Christ came to deliver you up out of that darkness. Don't know if you coming or going Sometimes you feel like a nut and sometimes you don't. Christ came to deliver you up out of that darkness. And then he brought and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Who bought our freedom with his blood and forgave us of all of our sins. He didn't just release us from bondage and, and then allowed us to just wander aimlessly. No. He snatched us out of the hand of the enemy, snatched us from the power of the devil, snatched us out of darkness and depression and defeat and despondency, and then he translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. He didn't leave us out there wandering. And we have to accept this and understand this. Matter of fact, the prophet Isaiah saw this event prophetically. He writes that the light that was coming into the world came to a people who was in darkness, who was in gloom, who was in anguish and contempt. You talk to a lot of people today that's depressed and in despondency. They don't know if they're coming or going. Everything they talk about is negative or something in the past or is, is something, you know, you feel worse leaving them than when you came. Anytime you talk to somebody and you leave with a headache, that's witchcraft. Somebody's trying to dominate your will got to understand Jesus birth signals an end of night and the beginning of morning an end of poverty and the beginning of wealth an end of confusion and the beginning of peace because God is not the author of confusion an end of sorrow and the beginning of joy please go with me to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 through verse 7 and we're looking at the old covenant the TPT version and it says no more gloom in verse 1 darkness for those who are in distress, anxiety. Although the Lord greatly humbled the regions of Zebulon and Naphtali, he will one day bestow upon them great honor from the Mediterranean eastward to the other side of the Jordan and throughout the Galilee of the Gentiles. In other words, though these regions here, they were the first to go into captivity, they will be the first to enjoy the blessings of God. Isaiah is prophesying the ministry of Jesus that would reverse the curse over that region. In the place where devastation had robbed hope, he will appear. I want to encourage you today, those who are listening to me under the sound of my voice, don't be discouraged this holiday season, feeling like you didn't have enough money to do what you wanted to do or get what you wanted to get. You need to put joy in your spirit and in your heart and thank God that you're breathing. And thank God that you're still alive because there are some people that's not alive. You need to understand this because that's the objective of the enemy to take our focus and our eyes off the purpose of Christmas. And you get caught up in the hustle and the bustle of the season. And, and instead of paying your rent and paying your water and your power and buying groceries, you somewhere buying toys. If you don't have the money to do it, you don't have the money to do it. And you sit them babies down and tell them the reason for the season. And I may not have it today, but I'm trying to tell you we're going to have it tomorrow. And may not have it in this season, but I'm trying to tell you a season coming, we're going to have it. Who am I talking to? May can't get it this Christmas, but by next Christmas, watch God work that thing out. Who am I talking to? You have to understand this. That these, these were the regions here that they were the first ones that was in poverty and they was broke and they went into captivity. You got to understand that the place of your shame, God's going to make sure that be the place of your praise. John 3.16 is a verse many of us know very well. But have you ever thought about it in terms of giving? God gave his only son. Why? Because he loves us. And that love meant he had to do something. 
You see, love requires an action. In the same way that you gave gifts to your loved ones yesterday on Christmas, not because they expected it and not because you were obligated to, but because you love them. It was just the natural response. So as you give on today, don't give out of routine, but give because you love God and his word. Give because this is a season that we're celebrating Jesus. And give because this is a means of seeing that all people are reached for Christ. If you have Cash App, go ahead. Take out your phone and type in the amount of your seat. And then KCM, Tampa, and the number two. For those of you without Cash App, you can go to our web link to sub. I pray that the presence of God always be with you as you all go throughout your lives. I'm accepted, I'm approved, I'm well pleasing to God. I'm accepted, I'm approved. Well pleasing to God, I make sense. I'm approved. Well pleasing to God, I make sense. I'm approved. Well pleasing to God, I make sense. Sometimes I stay trying to figure it out. Then you tell me I'm well pleasing. But I has washed away my sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But I has made. I'm approved. <laughs>